Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar on water-cooled electronics with uh, SimScale and thank you for joining us. My name is John Wild, I'm the Application Engineering Director here with SimScale. Um, I bring a pretty decent amount of experience uh, to the company and I'm running the pre and post sales engineering teams here. I'm also joined by my colleague Darren Lynch, he's a CFD guru, I would say. He's definitely a, an expert um, and he, he brings a huge amount of experience and he actually ran all the simulations that we're going to talk through today. Oh, yeah. So the agenda, at the beginning I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of using simulation and then a small introduction into who we are. Then I'm going to give a brief introduction into what we're going to talk about as a topic today which is CFD for water cooled electronics. Um, and then at that point I'll hand over to Darren who's going to run through a live demonstration and then talk about how we can get results from SimScale and start comparing and optimizing different designs. At any point if you have any questions you're more than welcome to ask just post them straight in the chat um, if they're kind of relevant to what we're talking about at the time um, I can start responding um, or we'll just kind of fit them in or we'll leave some to the end to discuss. Okay, so the benefits of using simulation um, are many, I would say. So uh, for us initially, we really want to try to speed up the design process and reduce physical prototyping. So ideally, you know, these what we're talking about today, they're not easy to make um, and not so easy to test. So if you can basically set something up in SimScale and figure out if it's going to work or get a good pass or fail idea before you build anything, and um, that's like the design path that we want to try to help you stay on. And then of course, by making sure that your components work within the um, design temperatures, and um, we can minimize failures, um, and often also we can reduce costs. I mean, a lot of parts are over-engineered and we can help to help you to optimize your designs so that you're not spending money where you don't need to. And of course, time um, can be hugely saved so instead of um, waiting to prototype models waiting to test them waiting to get results um, you can go from the CAD model that you already have on your screen into SimScale and start getting results and comparing different results side by side you know very very quickly the benefits for specifically for electronics design um, I guess finding the, the right placements for different components so you might have um, like either airflow through your model or here we've got um, a water channel through a, a cold plate. It's important to help make sure that the, the, the channel is in the right place to cool the components effectively or if you're working with air um, to make sure you can see where the air is moving to and make sure that it's moving over the components that you need to cool down. We can help of course um, reduce um, the energy that your components or that your model is consuming um, again by optimizing everything, optimizing the airflow, optimizing the positioning, um, and the, the types of components used. We can also uh, make comparisons between different types of cooling. So I guess there's four, and we'll talk about the, the obviously the, the most high density one as well. Um, but we can go from anything from natural convection, um, where we're, we're not forced cooling anything at all, um, moving to adding fans to the model, where we then start to force air through the model to, to help cool everything a little bit more. And we might then move to, say, adding heat pipes to really kind of start directing heat around in the model, again, probably with force convection. Um, but obviously, if that's not enough, then we can move to water cooling as well, and that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so a brief introduction um, as to who we are. Um, we're the first cloud-based and browser-based CFD and FEA tool. Um, our goal is essentially to free from any kind of constraints of Need requiring local hardware um, and give you the ability to run models and collaborate and analyze everything on the cloud. As I just mentioned, we have CFD and FEA all in one platform. Um, so anyone with a license to SimScale or access to SimScale has CFD and FEA um, all together. Um, everybody can share, say, one login and collaborate. Um, or you can share different models between different different people with different logins. So 
Everything is um, URL based, so you can share your projects very, very quickly between your teams or with um, anybody who you want to basically share your results with, so most likely customers also. I'd say we pride ourselves in our real-time support, so we have chat, um, and you'll see it when Darren shows the um, SimScale interface soon. Um, there's a small kind of chat icon in the right, and if you pop that up at any point, um, you can kick off a chat and start to ask us questions. So if you are running a model and you're stuck, um, or you're simply lonely, you can just give us a chat, and we'll be there to, to, to talk to you. Because we're cloud-based, um, you can essentially not just run one model, um, you might have, say, different um, different positionings of different components or different fan speeds or different um, heat loads that you want to test. You can set all of those up in one go and then run them all in parallel. And then you can get all the results back in the time it would, for all of them, in the time it, that it would take for one to run. So that's time efficient and cost efficient as well. Um, and obviously everything is um, very secure. So today's topic, um, as I said before, there's really four kind of different levels of cooling um, electronic equipment. The first and pretty common is natural convection. So that's nothing other than just the air moving past components as um, as the, the, the temperature drop, changes the density of the air and it rises and it pulls in cooler air from beneath. Um, we then move across obviously to, to forcing air through components. Um, and then kind of keep stepping up until we get to what we're looking at today. So if you've got very kind of high power components, you might need to start looking at um, really active water cooling, and that's what we're going to take a look through. So today we're looking at running um, four IGBT modules, um, all sitting side by side. Um, these are obviously really high power and generally need a lot of cooling. So just to take a quick step back before we kind of dive in a little bit deeper into what we're going to talk about specifically, um, this is using um, fans just to move air through a model. Um, and again, using SimScale, we can look at um, junction temperatures. We can look at how much heat is extracted from as the air moves through the model. Um, we can look at how much energy is consumed and get an idea also of where the heat is moving from and to. And obviously also looking at the air and making sure that it's moving efficiently through our parts. Can I just add here also, um, when we're looking at the heat path, what we actually want to be doing is understanding how the, uh, the heat moves from the sources, which in these cases would be the components, all the way through to the exit point, which would be the fluids. But we also want to understand where the resistances occur. So where, um, where the temperature is high and the gradients are high, these represent resistances which we need to reduce to actually improve the efficiency of the cooling. So that's also a, an area that we're going to be looking at today. See, there you go. Darren is the expert. Thanks, Darren. Um, okay, so what we're going to look at today specifically, um, this is a single IGBT, but, and you can see it's pretty um, crammed with um, electronics. We're going to look at four side by side. Um, and we're going to look at um, how the heat is dissipated from these. And we also have them sitting on a cold plate. But on the opposite side, we also have air moving past the components. So we're trying to kind of look at all the different cooling modes within one. So on the left, this is exactly what we're going to look at today. So you can see the, um, the four IGBT modules. Um, and you, can ha you have the water kind of flowing through the channels on the cold plate. And on the right-hand side, we have an air domain. So we also have air flowing past the heatsink. Um, so we're looking at water and air cooling at the same time. So these are like the three steps that we go through to move from CAD straight into SimScale. So you upload your model um, and then you run through the simulation setup and Darren is going to cover exactly how you would do that. And then once you've run your design and got some results, you can decide whether the model is good or bad or if it could be optimized um, and we're going to start making some small optimizations um, and then make some design decisions as well and then we can start to compare designs and decide which one is the best. So we're using, um, there's lots of different op analysis options within SimScale. Um, the one we're going to use today is conjugate heat transfer because that allows us to look at um, 
heat moving in between the solids. So we've got lots of different solid components where the heat needs to pass through. And then also into both air and water. And on the air side, obviously, we're going to be looking and capturing a natural convection. So this is actually the result of what we're going to show today. And then on the right, we have an inlet and an outlet where we've going to, we're going to have um, cold water kind of flowing through and cooling the cold plate and, again, drawing heat away from those IGBT modules. Okay, so I'm just going to take you quickly through the setup that we're going to run through. Um, and then after that, I'll hand over to Darren and he's going to get into the product and start kind of talking about um, how he approached this. So just to reiterate what we're going to run. Um, so on, we have four IGBT modules all sitting side by side on a cold plate. Um, you can see here we have flow th flowing through um, a path on the cold plate. So the blue is the cold water coming in and the red is the hot water or heated water leaving. So it's taking away heat from those IGBT modules. Um, and then on the, the box on the right is where we're going to have air and that's where the natural convection will take place. Okay, so this is our model um, and this is what we're going to take into SimScale and Darren can show you how we did that. We automatically mesh the model um, we thought we'd show the mesh for those of you that are interested in seeing what it would look like. Um, I think the important thing is we simply clicked automatic and that gave us enough to get some really great results. Okay, so this is where we set up our boundary conditions. Um, on the water side on the left, we have a velocity inlet. Um, here's where we tell SimScale how much flow is coming into the cold plate and we would also define the temperature. And then on this side, we've got the pressure outlet. So we've, that's where we're going to allow um, the warmer water to leave. And then on the right-hand side, we have something called an inlet outlet. And that's basically going to allow for natural convection to take place within the, within the air on the air side. Okay, and these are specifically like the flow rates that we've assigned um, and the standard um, temperature pressure on the atmospheric side. And just to run through a little bit more detail, so once we've set up our boundary conditions within SimScale, we also need to set up uh, our material conditions um, and our heat loads. So we've got these four modules with 368 watts applied to each. Um, we have a thermal interface between those and the solid. And we've obviously got our water, our air, and the brass connectors. And also, I was just going to comment on the, um, the thermal interface. Um, in this case, it's actually a phase change material. So when I first got this model, I was actually a bit perplexed as to why the um, thermal paste was actually so thick. It's actually so it can absorb the, um, the high energy shocks that are coming through um, during switching. So actually when these, um, these high loads come through, the, um, the paste actually changes its phase into a liquid, um, maintains its temperature um, for a short amount of time, and then passes it back, um, sort of releases that energy into the heat and the water block slowly. So that's the reason why they're actually so thick there. Um, and what I'm actually going to be doing later is actually designing around that um, phase change material. Okay, thank you, Darren. Um, I think at this point, anyway, I'll hand over to you um, and give you some time to run through the platform. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I think we're gonna hop straight into the, um, the live demonstration here. So starting out, you know, these are the, um, the live post-processing results of our um, simulation. Um, what I want to do is I want to kind of take you back and show you how we're going to um, create this case, how we're going to set it up, um, what sort of conditions we need to apply, what sort of um, modeling we've applied, and the assumptions that we've made. So starting right at the top, first of all, we, um, we upload a geometry. Um, this is a geometry that I prepared. Um, you know, I, I got given the geometry, but um, I also made these blocks that represent the fluid. So we have one block for the coolant, one block for the air, and just taking away these, we can see that we've also got blocks for the IGBT, um, the thermal paste, and the cooling block there. In addition to that, we've also got connectors um, which are located above that cooling block, and that's basically where the um, the inlet and outlet is going to be placed for the coolant. Um, moving on to the simulation, 
um, all we have to do is we have to say, okay, this is the geometry we're going to use for the simulation. And actually, in terms of meshing, um, we're lucky enough to provide a fantastic hex dominant uh, parametric, um, so hex dominant automatic mesher, which basically means that apart from defining the, uh, the inflate boundaries, this was all automatic. Um, and that was actually done uh, pretty quick, um, less than an hour. And um, we've got a fantastic resolution uh, mesh there. What I'm going to do is I can just hide a few things just to show you actually how um, how it's actually coped with these um, geometry, this complex geometry, um, which is pretty well, I think. So moving on from um, the mesh, um, we have to define a few things such as um, boundary conditions, um, heat sources, materials. So starting from the top, um, we just want to go, okay, what is the uh, what is the gravity of the model? Okay, so which direction is gravity moving in? And that's going to be very important for our um, natural convection of the air. And in this case, uh, the uh, gravity is actually acting in the negative x direction, you can see here. And what materials do we want to assign? So we have two materials, uh, two fluids, sorry. We have air and we have water. And I've assigned air naturally to the, the air block and water to the, the water channel here. Um, and I also made a few assumptions. Um, the, the IGBTs are um, modeled as a block. So we just say, okay, they, we could say that it's, it's a solid um, silicon. Um, in reality, it's not going to be the case, but actually, because we're applying the vol volumetric um, heat load, that's not actually that important. What is important, however, is applying the thermal paste to that next layer, aluminium to the, um, the water block, and brass to the, uh, the connectors. And next, we're going to say, okay, so we need to, uh, we need to initialize our um, simulation with some results. Now, the most important initialization values are actually temperature for the conjugate heat transfer case. Um, and that is because we want to have some sort of um, te temperature difference between the solids to actually get a good start to the simulation. So as long as there's heat transfer at the start of the simulation, we actually get convergence faster. So in this case, we've actually taken, um, we've taken the fluids uh, to be the coldest um, the IGBTs to be the hottest, and everything in between a gradual step down, just to make sure there is some kind of um, heat transfer taking place at um, iteration one. And then what we're going to say is, okay, so where does where does fluid come in and out of our domain? Um, uh, we can do that in the boundary conditions. So the water flow in is applied to the water channel on this face. Um, I set it as a, a velocity a fixed velocity that could be a mass flow rate however or volumetric flow rate um, doesn't matter and I've also said the water is actually coming out of that face there and it is going to be into one standard atmosphere um, so they're the assumptions we've made on the boundary conditions for the water um, and I've also said for the air you know I just want it to naturally come into the domain and flow over the IGPTs and the the heated um, heated solids and flow back out again. So I've made a pressure inlet outlet um, velocity, uh, sorry, pressure inlet outlet, and I've said anything that's coming into the domain is going to be at 293 degrees Kelvin, and it's going to have these turbulent values. And on the back face there, I just wanted to fix the pressure. So it's got the same conditions, but I just wanted to fix that pressure at one standard atmosphere, which is what I've done. And then, in terms of adding the power sources, um, actually what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hide the air. Adding the power sources can be done um, by selecting um, each solid that you want to add a power source. And I've actually defined it as, um, from the manufacturers, 368 watts um, in heat dissipation. And that is basically all we need to do to uh, set up our simulation. Um, but we can, however, define additional um, result controls. So we can say we want to monitor certain points in our domain. We want to know how that looks in terms of convergence. And um, 
we can do that here. We can either do surface data, which I used to actually find the, um, the amount of heat removed by the water. So I can work out the temperature difference between the inlet and the outlet, and from that work out how much energy is removed. Um, and I also just wanted to monitor convergence um, in a fluid domain in the air. And I did that using probe points. And finally, um, we can uh, create a simulation run. We can monitor the convergence. And we can also look at um, the water flow rates and things like that whilst the simulation is running, which you can see we've got quite a nice convergence there for the, um, for the temperature in the fluid uh, in the water. And that finally leads us to our results, which we were able to show you right at the beginning. Um, but we're going to look at that really in a lot more detail in the presentation. So I think I'm going to leave the platform here and move back to the presentation and just kind of walk you through the results, my observations, um, how I think it can be improved, and um, actually showing you the results of those changes as well and determining if they were actually any good. Hey, Darren, just a quick um, pause for a second. So thanks for everything so far. That's a, a nice guide, I think. Um, I've answered a lot of questions in chat, but I, there's none left. Um, so if anybody would like to ask anything else, feel free to type away, and I'm sure we can get them answered for you. Thanks, Darren. Sure. sure. Yeah. And so there's no questions covered, you know? No, not yet. Okay, great. Everything. Okay, no um, So hopping back. Okay, so we had basically three designs. I started with a base design, um, and this is going to be my analysis of that base design. So um, the observations I actually saw initially was that there was a huge temperature gradient um, over the thermal paste, which is actually the phase change material. Um, and initially, you know, I had to do some research. Why, why is the thermal paste so thick? Um, this isn't, to my knowledge, this isn't normal, but it's because of that phase change material and the, the absorbance of the, um, the high energy shocks that it's taking that it needs to be this thick. But obviously, um, the problem being is at this current setup, we can't, um, we can't transfer enough energy, uh, sorry, enough power through that, um, through that phase change material quick enough. So, you know, Using this observation, we can say, okay, we've either got to make this thinner or we've got to change the design in some way to um, reduce the thickness or reduce the gradient um, of that phase change material. And I'm going to kind of discuss um, what we could do about that later on, but these are just my observations. Um, in terms of the temperature distribution in the, um, the water block, um, it's as we would expect. Um, it's uneven. It's colder towards the end in which the uh, cold water is coming in, and it's hotter in the high end um, where the, the warmer water is coming out. And we can also observe where the um, the IGBT devices are actually located in the in the hot points um, of this fluid. And also, I'm, I am going to comment on the fluid in the next slide as well. But we can also see a lot of recirculation. Um, recirculation is happening here, um, which is possibly better viewed when looking um, when looking at a pressure and field, which is exactly what we've done here. So looking at the, the way the fluid flows through uh, the design, the, through the water channel, we can see there's um, a lot of contractions, there's a lot of um, flow separations. For example, we have a flow separation at this point here, we've got contraction at these points here and at this point here. And also, the, the angle in which the flow is coming in is being separated quite a lot as it's going over those, um, those heat sink things and separating and recirculating here. And all of this is going to contribute to a high pressure drop between the inlet and outlet. And if we remember, pressure drop is directly going to lead to the amount of energy that we need to put into um, pumping the fluid through the channel. Now, whether that energy that we put in to pump that fluid through the channel is proportional to the amount of energy it actually removes is a, another discussion which we will have later on. So, 
So looking at the same view, but this time with velocity, um, I've kind of um, really emphasized on the uh, flow separations. Once again, you can see in terms of velocity where that um, separation has occurred, um, we're getting uneven flow. So as we would expect, the, uh, the fluid is a lot faster through the center channels, but slower towards the outside. And that's also going to affect the efficiency in which we cool um, cool the solid. Because if we have a faster fluid moving down the middle, then obviously we would expect to remove more heat along that channel rather than where the fluid would be going for, uh, slower. And finally, this is this is my favorite post-processing image, by the way. This is a, um, a volume rendering of the heat within the, uh, the water cooling block. And what we can see is the same observations we made before but in three dimensions where we can see obviously that the very hot region where the IGBT is transferring heat to the cooling block, but it's a lot higher than the, the end in which the cold air is coming, uh, cold water is coming into. Um, but the real takeaway from the slide is we actually did a calculation. Um, we did a calculation as to how much um, energy is being removed by the water and how much energy is being removed um, through natural convection. And it probably won't surprise us that the, uh, the amount of power being removed by the natural convection is a lot lower than the power being removed by the water cooling. Um, and in fact, in this, in this particular um, setup, it's about 7.4% is being removed by natural convection. Now, if we improved this design, and um, was able to reduce the resistance between um, the IGBT and the water block, then I'd expect that number to actually be lower. Um, so to save us computation time, we could actually either model um, the air on the outside of the block, or we could um, just neglect it completely if we're trying to op optimize just the water cooling. Um, and that would save us a considerable amount of time and would be a good assumption. I guess, Darren, this would also save manufacturing costs, right? So if you'd, um, if you'd assume that you wanted to cool both ways and actually try to have a heat sink on the back to like enable and make the most of natural convection, um, you're just wasting your money, basically. Uh, yes, and, and you could even model that if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if you added a heat sink into the back, I wouldn't imagine that the 7.4% would increase very dramatically. So yes, you would be wasting money in that case. Cool. Yeah, I thought. Thanks. Thank you. So, from this initial um, this initial uh, calculation using CFD and the conjugate heat transfer method, we actually took um, probe points located within the um, the devices and said, okay, what is the uh, the temperature right at the centre of those devices, and we said that the highest acceptable temperature would be about 90 degrees. An ideal temperature would be about 70 degrees. And in fact, this design, um, we're coming in significantly higher, um, close to about 160 degrees Celsius. So that's really made me think in terms of, okay, how can we um, reduce this resistance between the, uh, the cooling block and the, um, the devices? So I made some um, summaries. Okay, so the junction temperatures are too high. And the cause of that is the heat is being transferred out of the component fast enough. Um, and that is due to the high resistances from the phase change material. So we could do it a few things. And in fact, I want to add to this solution. Um, we could improve the grade of the PCM. We could uh, reduce the thickness of that PCM. But reducing thickness is actually going to... Um, is going to reduce its effectiveness in a transient problem. Um, and that is possibly going to neglect, or sorry, reduce its effect um, that we really don't want to be doing. Um, and another solution that I researched and found some answers about was actually that um, we could put a phase change material between, say, heat pipes or um, some kind of um, heat sink it would still have the same effect, but it would actually um, allow the resistance um, between the module and the uh, cooling block to um, be a lot less. And we can demonstrate that in a minute. 
The second problem um, was a fluid flow problem. So the flow channel is not very efficient. You can visually see um, where the resistance is in terms of pressure losses are coming from. Um, and we can very quickly just um, do some modifications uh, to the cooling block um, in terms of geometrically um, widening channels, um, reducing um, sharp edges, um, adding fillets, those kind of things will automatically give you um, pressure loss reductions and that will become visible soon. So I performed two design improvements. The first one was combating this, um, the fact that the, the devices were too high in temperature. And to combat that, I did two things. I did reduce the volume of the phase change material. And I think if I was going back to do it again, I'd, I'd reintroduce that volume. But the main change here is the heat sink between the, the phase change material and the IGBT uh, device. So what we're effectively doing is we're increasing the, um, in, increasing the heat transfer through um, the phase change material by getting those fins closer to the cooling block. And the amount of uh, phase change material it directly has to pass is a lot less. And what we're actually going to see when we have a look at results um, right here is that the gradient of the, um, the temperature in the Z direction, which is you know, this direction here, um, we don't get high gradients until right at the tips of that um, heat sink. And that's very important because effectively we've, um, we've, reduced, um, we've reduced that gradient from somewhere, somewhere out here all the way to this tiny little sliver here. And a further design improvement might be to, um, to bring those um, heat sink pins all the way to this block. And hopefully we'd see this kind of gradient all the way through whilst maintaining the volume of the phase change material. And that would allow us to effectively move the heat from the device to the cooling block much quicker. And the, uh, the outcome of that is actually quite significant. So we've reduced the, uh, the temperature from about 160 degrees all the way down to around 50 degrees Celsius, um, which gives us a little bit of playroom what we can do is we can go and do what we said and we say okay we could increase that volume of the phase change material we could um, push the pins all the way to the cooling block and we can see what effect that has and I would expect either no change or positive change um, if we did that. Okay so moving on to the second design improvement um, the design improvement that we made here was um, actually based on these results we can see that um, you know we've got all these resistances um, in the flow uh, separation contractions um, we have low pressure regions high pressure regions and um, to get rid of that what we're actually going to do is we're going to go back to that cooling channel and we're going to um, try and combat as many of these points as possible so the geometry when I finished with it looked similar to this. So we can see that we've these these contractions um, we've expanded them so that they're not so tight. Um, I couldn't do anything about this knob there because that is actually where um, some kind of mounting would be. Um, so some of these changes I can't make, but I can certainly pull uh, pull the channel out here. I turned the the uh, heatsink fins into pins. Um, that is going to reduce the amount of um, flow separation, but also it's not going to restrict the direction in which the flow can um, move. So before we had this situation where the flow was coming in almost 90 degrees to where we actually wanted it to go. In this design, that's not going to matter. It's just going to flow through the pins freely and um, not cause any huge pressure losses. And the results of those changes are actually quite dramatic. Um, if we compare um, compare the results um, in a minute, then we're going to see that actually they're almost halved in terms of pressure loss. And you can see that's exactly the effect that we've um, we've managed to get. So we're coming in at 90 degrees here, and it's happily flowing through the pins, um, straightening up, 
Um, the only thing that we could possibly improve further is the, the flow separation at this side. But I don't think that's really going to be significant enough to spend too much time on. Uh, and overall, we got about a 50% um, 50 improvement in the amount of power that it takes to push the water through that design. So it's a saving of about 0.45 watts, um, which might be significant over its entire lifetime, but when you compare it to the amount of energy that it's um, removing from the device, um, it's actually fairly insignificant, um, but certainly going to improve its lifetime costs. So in summary then, um, we can use the SimScale platform and the conjugate heat traps for analysis to understand really complex designs consisting of fluids and solids. We can understand um, where the gradients are going to be and thus where the resistances are going to be um, in terms of our uh, thermal um, heat path, if you like, from the hot um, emitting device all the way through to the outlet. Um, we can also understand how the heat transfer of the air and um, the water cooled device, um, the water, uh, the air is actually quite small, and we could actually model it to reduce. Um, we could reduce our simulation time. And as John said, you know, if, if you're concentrating in putting some uh, design in the the air cooling part, then that would actually be wasted. Um, we can understand the internal temperatures of the IGBTs, and we can bring them down to an acceptable less um, level by um, monitoring um, how we can actually reduce those resistances. And we can also understand how the flow moves through the design and where pressure losses incurred can be reduced and make those changes and ultimately understand how effective those changes have become. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I don't know if there's any additional questions that have been asked in the forums um, in the chat. Yeah, there were uh, to um, to our presentation. Yeah, yeah, there were, Darren. Um, <laughs> there was actually two that I think um, you could answer, and I definitely can't. So one was um, how long did the simulation take? Um, and was it run on the cloud? And I already answered the cloud part that, yes, everything we do is browser-based and everything is run on the cloud. Um, but I don't know how long it took. Um, so this one here took 288 minutes. Um, and if we wanted to run five different scenarios with different flow rates, um, maybe, then we could run all of those in parallel and we'd still get all the results back in 288 minutes. So, yeah, a huge advantage of using the cloud-based simulation there. But I guess you could also, I don't know how many um, core hours, uh, sorry, um, cores you ran it on, right? So you could probably up that and get results faster if you really wanted to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, it's not it's not linear, but at the moment, we're running on 64 cores because I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other question that I, I couldn't answer was they, they wanted to see something in the um, platform itself. So within the results, is there any way that you could show how to add streamlines? Absolutely, yeah. Let me just bring up the results. So um, basically on the platform here, um, we've got the list of filters on the left-hand side here. Um, so the, the particle tracer or the stream tracer um, is under this section here, particle tracers. And it's, it's kind of a two-step process, this. Um, we've got all of our main definitions here, but to actually um, position this, we need to go onto seeds and there's an option to pick and what you can actually do is you pick the face in which you want to um, in which you want to seed from so I've actually picked the inlet here which is pretty sensible um, so what I've actually done now is I've picked the face at the inlet of that cut plane um, a bit different um, let me just hide that cut plane one second right um, and there's a few things that we can do um, to control how many streamlines we have and kind of its distribution. Um, so we can control its spacing, um, which is the distribution here. Um, so for example, if I wanted to um, uh, make it less dense, I could change that to two and there would be more of a spacing between each seed. 
Um, if I wanted to increase the number of um, seed points, I could say change that to five, five, and that would actually give me a five by five box. And the other thing we get to do is change the radius of those um, those streamlines. So we can say if we wanted to make them twice as big, then if we just change that to one, then we get twice as big streamlines. Um, and obviously you can do this by selecting any face um, that's visible. Um, sometimes, you know, just hiding some faces and making others visible will give you the results that you want. So uh, that's how you visualize it on the platform. Thanks, Darren. And then there's a couple of other questions. Um, one is, um, how would we kind of compare results side by side? And I know we can't do that right directly in the interface, but I guess what you can do on the left um, is look at like pro points, for example. So you could look at a probe of one um, versus another, right? And I think that maybe is the best way to compare, unless you have a better idea. Um, but I, th I thought maybe that's something that's interesting to show. Yeah, so um, the way I actually did and pull the main results uh, from the simulation is through these uh, result control items. So we can, without even opening it into a post-processor, we can understand what the pressure losses through the, um, the fluid is, um, what the temperature differences are, thus getting the, um, the actual heat transferred out through the fluid. And I also was able to monitor the temperature of the, um, of the, uh, the components. And that's done straight in here. So you can see you've got each IGBT device and that correlates to a temperature. So that's that's basically how I read all this data into the um into the results. Okay, thanks. And it also suggests, right, that um we ran this for like a thousand time steps, but you could probably run for less because everything looks very stable, right, after a few hundred. Yeah, so um it actually depended on um, the level of conversion sometimes I applied um, I applied a different um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the word <laughs> one second um, a different relaxation factor and if I ch change the relaxation factor I need to run for longer so if, certainly for the um, the last design iteration um, we, we got convergence just before the thousand fifth iteration okay but the um, but the first one obviously we got convergence a lot earlier and that's it's it's very important for you to monitor these result controls during the simulation to make sure that you have got convergence and you can rely on those results okay um and then two other questions i've just pinged you them um in a chat as well so you can have a look um sure. i'll read them out as well so um i can't answer them <laughs> how's the phase chase how was the phase change in the pace taken into account um, and can you kind of talk about the properties and how we set that up? And then also, would reducing the PCM volume increase the cooling efficiency, or do we need like a specific volume? Yeah. So the the idea between phase of the phase change material is that okay, if we it, it's a transient problem, phase change. Um, so we can't simulate it in our steady state case, but we we should still consider it. So if our, um, if our device is um, giving a constant um, heat dissipation, but all of a sudden peaks, um, what it's actually going to do is it's going to, the, the phase change material is going to maintain the temperature, thus absorbing that um, heat from the, uh, from the device by changing its phase. And then it's going to slowly release that, um, that heat into the heat sink without changing temperature. I mean, that's the idea, because a, a material whilst it's changing phase, it won't, won't increase in temperature whilst it's going through that phase change. Um, obviously, the more volume we have, the more energy it can absorb. So by reducing that volume, we actually risk um, not absorbing these pulses of um, high, uh, high heat. Um, so it's, it's good to do a calculation to know how much um, phase change volume you're going to need, which we didn't do in this case. Um, so we should revisit that if this was a real design scenario. Um, and then we need to maintain that volume. So as I said, we could actually push those heatsink pins all the way through to the um, all the way through to the cooling block, and have the same volume of um, phase change material between those fins, and that would still deliver the same effect but improve our efficiency. That makes sense. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Um, okay, 
Thanks, Darren. Um, there's one other question um, which I can talk to, um, and that is, does Simska have its own CAD modeling domain? Um, at the moment, no, mainly because most people know their own CAD programs pretty well, right? Um, so there are some things that you can do in Simska, like building the, um, the fluid, for example. Um, but it's something weird, but it's something we're discussing, I think. Um, but at the moment, no, um, it's better, I think, to do everything in CAD where you know how to use the, the platform. Okay, so that, that that is the total list of questions, and I think the end of the webinar. Unless you had anything else to add, Darren? No, I think that's good on my phone. Okay, then um, we'll say simply thank you very much for joining us, and um, hopefully you can join the next one that we run in a few weeks' time. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye.